Okay, thank you. So I have written here the three topics, crash simulation results, they have stochastic behavior, and we use data reduction technologies in order to try to understand where the stochastic behavior comes from. So just uh, a short background on my organization. Fraunhofer is a huge research organization in Germany. We are about 18,000 people. Most of them are engineers. And we are committed to closely work with um, industry because most of our funding actually is from <coughs> joint projects or direct funding from industry. So we have seen an um, introductory presentation today where you say, yes, there is a, a model, something like I would like to understand, simulate, or uh, have experiments from. We have parameters where we are going to change, or which are, show some stochastic behavior. And then we have characteristic values, like uh, maximum force, or like um, uh, the topic where we were hitting the wall, where we show some stochastic behavior. And for the actual design, uh, we have a design target and we need to move um, um, the design in such a way that um, so the <coughs> whole curve with uh, some uh, uh, certainty uh, fulfills the actual design criteria. And this is achieved by changing the parameters. But um, as in the talk already this morning was uh, emphasized in your presentation where you went through all the possible uncertainties, we have two extra beasts. One is the model itself, which may show some stochastic and uncertainty behavior. And then things are not always quite clear in terms of parameters. So when you have plates, for example, and you have variations of this. This is not a single number. This is a variation of fields. And again, there is the question about <coughs> how to model, how to generate, how to work with thickness distributions and with node positions. So today in my presentation, I will focus on this beast here in the middle, which is the actual design target in many cases. And I will give a short outlook how this can be handled in a practical way. So what we do is we have a small tool which reads a number of simulation results, performs a stochastic analysis not on the target values, but actually on the full simulation results, and then adds this statistic information to a basic simulation model so that you can use a standard post-processor and see all this statistical outcome on your simulation result itself. So we do statistical analysis for full simulation models, and what's new there is different mode analysis. Um, if you need to store all the simulation results, you will get a substantial amount of data. So fortunately, there is a solution for that. We have FEMZIP, which is a data compression tool which gets a factor of 10 on LSDINA, PEMCRASH, RADIUS, NASTRAN, star CD, and open form results. So this is going to help you to keep the data, but not fully fill up your disks <coughs> in this space. So here you can see this. Ah. Ah. Sorry for that. <coughs> So here you can see this again for a CFD example, uh, which was flow around the car. So you had uh, 40 gigabyte of results. If you use uh, WinZip, for example, you get 32 gigabytes. And if you use FEMZIP on this, you get 4 gigabytes. So this gives you a factor of 10. So what we have seen in, in context of uncertainty with the car model itself is different reasons for instabilities. So there are numerical reasons, like contact search or contact treatment, which in itself might be instable due to zero one decisions or due to penetration, due to some heuristics, and then putting things back uh, in an unclear situation of the simulation code itself. There is modeling by engineers, which is simplifications. 
So we had this topic already in your presentation this morning, where you, for example, assume constant thickness all over the parts, which is not actually true, and this might cause some instabilities or modeling errors like two massive folding points. There is the behavior uh, of something which monitors or is, would be there also in the real car, uh, like buckling or like um, cracks, which shows a very, very undeterministic behavior. And so this is also a mixture between simulations and numeric features and realities of friction and failure may be uh, wrongly modeled or might be in reason for instabilities of the whole car itself. Buckling. Uh, we one can see buckling here. It's a nice example for buckling. So when things get heated up, metal expands. So if you have a straight line, then it's undetermined how t the buckling is going to take place, whether it's going to the right or to the left or something. And so this is just a very nice real case example. So this is uh, box beams. So this is modeled, so uh, longitudinal rays and cars are modeled a little bit like box beams. And you, we know from theory that the falling might be this way or the other way. Uh, and you can flip a coin and you will have one situation or the other. So this is the car Dietmar mentioned in his presentation from Jacek, where he, uh, actually from BMW, where he showed that, um, yes, the angle of attack of the barrier has some impact. Unfortunately, it's not the barrier itself, it's buckling. So these are buckling sources all over the car, and um, there are about 40 cases. And this is the source on the longitudinal rail, and this is the course of scatter. So you can flip a coin here with respect to this point, and you get two fully different behaviors on the longitudinal rail. So changing the barrier yeah, just gives some noise to the model, which causes this longitudinal rail here to behave different. So the reason what we are going to do and investigate is uh, explained here. This is um, a rabbit from uh, Volkswagen, and they had scatter in the firewall intrusion as a result of the simulations for more than 10 millimeters. And they didn't change the lot with respect to the external parameters. They just run the same simulation a number of times. Okay. So 10 millimeters is too big for them in terms of instability. So we uh, looked for maximum scatter, and we did some correlation analysis among the uh, scatter points on the geometry. And we found out that this area here on the longitudinal rail is a major source of scatter. So this, we determined this if, uh, for example, the scatter on the spit wall here shows a high correlation with the scatter at a different point. <coughs> at this point, there is a high probability that the behavior at this point is the source for the scatter at the spit wall. Okay, so Volkswagen introduced an additional band here at this point to determine that the uh, longitudinal array always behaves the same way. So you can see here, this is the favored uh, deformation. And after introducing this band, the firewall intrusion was reduced to three millimeters. So the scatter of the simulation result is much less. So we introduced now a new mathematical background for the analysis, which is a revisiting of some very old principle, which is called uh, principal component analysis. And what we do is, if you have a number of simulation results, we have a pointer here. So if you have a number of simulation results x, <coughs> you can build the x bar as an average. And then we try to approximate the actual solution, which might depend on a certain number of parameters, by the average plus um, deformations of the average. Okay, So you may have a number of modes or differences which approximate the average solution. Okay, so the target is to find these variation modes in such a way that the difference between the actual results 
and the approximated results using these number of modes is small that you have a small number of modes and that um, the modes itself have uh, a real physical meaning. So do, those of you who are familiar with structural analysis, you will have frequency response. So there are some basic modes and some basic frequencies and the response on a noise source somewhere in the model is always a linear combination of the frequencies and the um, um, the, the, uh, the, the uh, the vectors, the, the motion vectors, which you compute out of there. And this is similar to that, but just it's applied to crash simulation. Okay? So, the question is, <coughs> is it possible to choose the number of base vectors substantially smaller than the number of uh, simulation results to be put in, or do you have to choose this as the same? And the other thing is, we want to have this um, showing a physical meaning. And the question is, what is the physical meaning in this context? So that it's possible shows this example. We did an analysis for a Ford Taurus model uh, with um, 100 simulation results. Some of them were um, um, uh, changed by uh, thickness parameters. And we just determined the, uh, an equivalent to the covariance matrices on the basis of the actual simulation results, performed some PCA analysis, and got this type of distribution here in terms of the importance factors. So what do we learn from this? Although we have a nonlinear crash simulation result, the difference between the individual crash simulation results here can be explained by just say five base vectors okay so we have here one two three four five base vectors which are much bigger than the rest and we see from this example that just taking five effects into account gives you uh, more than yeah uh, a good approximation for the simulation results up to 20 percent of the differences so 80% of the differences you can explain by just looking at five modes. Okay? So instead of looking for 100 results, you are just looking for five results. Okay? So this is explained here again. So in this case, if you do this type of analysis, this type of PCA analysis, you can approximate the difference by a linear combination of these modes and then the rest in L2 norm is smaller than LK. Yeah, and this is what we have seen here before. So this means for this case here, if you take five modes into account, here we have something like 12, this was 46. So the error is only 20%, 30% of um, the whole simulation. So these modes gives you then a very good understanding about the variation, what is actually happening with your simulation result. So this is uh, for Taurus. And you can see here scatter plots of the most <coughs> important modes. So what you see here is the maximum variation of the simulation results due to mode 1 and here due to mode 2. So here it's clear. You see there is some buckling there where the gearbox is and the uh, engine moves from the, uh, uh, yeah, from here is the, no, the gearbox, I think, uh, and the coverage of the gearbox. So it moves up and down. And so this is why it's here red. Red means a very high standard deviation. Okay. So here it's different. You can see here there's some scatter up here, there's some scatter up there, and there is a substantial scatter influencing the, um, the spit wall. So actually you are not interested itself in the whole car. There are certain design criteria like the behavior of the spit wall. So you can take the spit wall on its own and then look on the variations on the spit wall and you can see here it's one dominating mode and three others and this explains almost 85% of the simulation results of the deformations of the spit wall with these five modes. And we can again look on the car and look for the five modes and they look very similar to that what we had before. So how to introduce a physical meaning? A physical meaning, you can see this here by looking on the 
uh, scatter plots of the car at different <coughs> states. So here is state zero, it's the beginning, so you see here there is no scatter at all. So at state eight, you have something starting <coughs> here in the area of the longitudinal rail. And in state 34, you have a whole, um, yeah, a lot of scatter all over the car. So what happens here is that if you think in terms of the modes, you have one single effect here at this point. That is the longitudinal rail is going to uh, either uh, move this way towards uh, the uh, inside or towards the outside. Okay, so you have a one-dimensional effect. Okay, so here you have a higher dimensional effect, so something has to be added to the sources. So by comparing the effective solution space here with the effective solution space there, you can see from the difference something has happened. So if you have a new bifurcation, you will have a new mode in the space of solutions. And if you look for the difference, you clearly can identify the mode and the reason for the uh, scatter there. So we use this for the uh, whole car. And as a result of this, with respect to the spit wall, we see here a single source of scatter uh, of the upper longitudinal rail. And we can correlate this to the change of parameters. So the different behavior here, and therefore, as a consequence, the different behavior at the spit wall is just the result of the parameter changes. So this one is another bifurcation, which we haven't seen before which is here clearly identified due to the PCA analysis and it's a buckling on the lower longitudinal rail and that's the second most important uh, bifurcation mode with respect to the deformation of the spit wall. And if you look for the third one, it's just the same on the other side of the wall. It's clearly identified that there is a bifurcation on the longitudinal rail on the other side. So what we have identified here and used is variations of parameters might give you some uncertainty with respect to the simulation results. But the simulation itself, the model itself, even the physical model as we have seen here, might also have some indeterministic behavior which creates not sensitivity but chaos. And you will see this in your simulation results as an answer to small changes in the inputs will might result in very, very big changes in the simulation results itself. So, like in the case of the uh, uh, barrier variation, the barrier variation is not the reason for that. So, by reducing the barrier variation or making this in a different manner, you will not be able to reduce the scatter and the reliability of your prediction. You need to dig into the model and find in the model itself the source of uncertainty and the source of, of scatter. And this type of PCA analysis is something like the poor man's approach to that because in reality you would like to have HESA matrices and the joint operators and so on and analyze them. And this is just the first level linear approximation to all this. In crash simulation, determining an adjoint operator, I think, is a little bit complicated. So there is another application to that, which comes back to the variation of um, um, thicknesses over the, the model. So we had a project together with a German car manufacturer, and he gave us uh, 48 uh, B-pillars. So you will be, see the B-pillar later. So colleagues of us at the Fraunhofer Institutes crashed the B-pillar, which means a component test of the B-pillar with some weight in the middle and then a controlled deformation of the B-pillar. And we did some simulations and we did some stochastic <coughs> analysis by doing measurements on the B-pillar of thickness variations and so on and trying to, to uh, have a model for that. Okay, so then we had an expert there also for metal forming and he said, Instead of looking on this model, do all these measurements and then some uh, distance correlation things of the thicknesses. So if the thicknesses varies here, the, the variation is similar to that. So you have some correlation length of parameters where you do the modeling. He said, garbage. Don't do that. Do use a much more a pragmatic approach. 
So when you do sheet metal forming, the number of parameters are quite small. So the geometric thing here is more or less the plate. Okay, and the dominating things are material parameters like the roughness of the metal forming part, how many oil is there on the sheet, the force, some direction of the, the material properties of the vaulting. So we identified eight parameters here, and then we did a robust design DOE stuff in metal forming exercises, which gives you different types of um, um, uh, thickness distribution here. So, in order to have a full process out of that, we would now need the same procedure for all important parts in the car, say 10, 15, something like that, parts, which would mean 40 times 15 means 400, 600 simulations, which in theory would mean also 600 crash simulations, because you would need to do a crash simulation for each combination of that. So this is impractical. So this is why we apply the same framework as before in modeling the result of the metal forming exercise here. So we found that there are two variation modes which determine the behavior on the longitudinal rail. So we are down to two parameters out of 40 simulations. And so having 10 parts means 20 parameters. It's still feasible to do a DOE type of thing with 20 parameters for a full car. So again, this data reduction methods I introduced before allows you to do some stability stochastic analysis of this part. So what's the result of that? If you just do some parameter <coughs> variations, without taking the right material model into account, you will see a very deterministic result of the uh, deformation of the longitudinal rail, which does, uh, of the B-pillar, which does not fit to the experiments. Only if you take a very sophisticated material model, so you need to do, like you said in the morning, you need to do the right modeling, and only if you take the variations of the things into account from the metal forming exercise, you will see here these two different deformation patterns, in particular here in this area, which luckily coincides with the behavior of the B pillar in their variation in reality. So this shows also that there is a way by this modeling data reduction technologies to solve one of the issues like field variation in some applications of uh, engineering. Okay, thank you. Questions, comments? Oh, sorry, please. Uh, on your earlier part of your presentation, you, you said that there was a bifurcation that could go either way. Uh, did you then go on to an engineering solution to make it more predictable? Or did you I think, Richard, in your presentation, you will have such a case with the airbag. Uh, yeah, 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 some of the detail, obviously it's not the same example, but ah. some of the general principles in terms of how to Okay. <coughs> so um, we did an engineering exercise for the BMW by introducing also an additional band uh, and got it stable for parallel computing but not really for small parameter changes. But as you have seen from the example from Volkswagen, so they identified the, uh, the piece on the longitudinal rail and they actually got uh, uh, a fix there and a much better behavior. So if there's a bifurcation problem then sort of that's yeah. like saying the straight line is not good. You actually want to introduce the bending mode, buckling mode, yes. from, from, in, from scratch. Yes. Force one or the other. Yes. Could you just clarify the different modes that you're looking at there? How were they being <coughs> determined? Where were they coming from? So, the, since PCA is a purely mathematical <coughs> approach, it's just the like PCA says and like the framework says, mm -hmm. it's just like the dominating variations of the simulation results. So you can put this uh, in the analysis if you have parameter changes or not, it doesn't depending and it shows 
uh, yeah, it gets the essence of the variation of the simulation results to you. Okay. But it's just a mathematical formulation. It's like eigenvalues okay. and eigenvectors. Okay. So okay. it's no physical background. So uh, what we try is, if you have this <coughs> five-dimensional space, to ch choose the, the modes in such a way that they really have a physical meaning. Okay. okay. So <coughs> this um, uh, superposition of uh, these modes is uh, a method which is also used in harmonic response analysis and dynamics or so, and there we have always the limitation that it's only valid if I have a linear model. So if I don't have you know, changing contact <coughs> conditions in between, and uh, what, do you expect uh, that the precision is influenced <coughs> of your method or of the PCA is influenced by the degree of linearity in the model? So if you have uh, changing contacts uh, due to deformations and so on? Yes. yes. So. Yeah, having something is better than having nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we are working on um, migrating the concept also to uh, nonlinear approaches. So what helps is um, to look at scatter plots, like we have seen this in the presentation of Dietmar, but here of the coefficients of the modes against, against each other. And if you see an additional structure there, then you have some kind of a nonlinearity. So you approach a nonlinear effect with a linear base functions, and the number of modes is then bigger than the actual. So if you have a, a, a curve like that, yeah, so it's essentially a linear behavior, but you need two base vectors in order to approach this. And the same can happen also in this context. And um, so far, People are working on trying to find this out and characterizing that, but an efficient method is to look at this, yeah? And then you will see this. Yeah, uh, you mentioned a number of parameters need to, uh, to describe your model, but uh, have you mentioned anything about uh, the loading the cost factor, meaning the amount of information you put on mode one, mode two, and mode three from your data? Yes, um, the, um, <coughs> from the PCA analysis, you get these modes, but you also get the um, how much each of these modes um, 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 is, um, influ is, is contained in each of the simulation results. Yep. Okay, so we take the maximum there and take this as the, bone, uh, the bounds on the crash simulation. Values you have like uh, considerably different than zero. I mean, how many modes are uh, uh. relevant? U usually in a problem like like that. I mean, ten, one hundred, one thousand. So it it varies a lot. So if you have a clear one bifurcation in your model, it's one mode. Yeah. If you have, uh, I have seen situations like it's one dominating and then three, four, five, which are the same, and then you would like to ne neglect the rest. I have seen situations where I had four, five of similar size. Um, yeah, but um, in many cases it's one, two, or three, which you would like to consider. And for this analysis, if you have uh, too many parameters which you actually vary, which are important on themselves, the nonlinearity of the model is going to kill you because then there is too much noise in there. So you would like to do these experiments with a small number of parameters actually varied. <coughs> Otherwise, you need also too many simulations to be able to separate effects. Okay, thank you very okay, much. Thank, thank you. you.